Good evening, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to our Astronomy 102 series. My name is Octave, and I'm from Science Center Singapore. I'm a science educator there. And with me, I have a returning guest, Mei Pao. You might remember her from one of our previous episodes, Living in Space. So Mei Pao, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Yes, I was here a few weeks ago on Living in Space. Living in space. And my name is Mei Pao. I'm a senior science educator with the Life Sciences Department of the Science Center. So thank you very much, Octave. All right. So today our topic of discussion is about life in space, right? And I am not an expert in biology. So to answer this question, we have a very special guest with us today, Prof Lim Technik, Chief Executive of Science Center Singapore and Associate Professor for the NUS Department of Biological Sciences. TM, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Hello, everybody. And uh, thank you, Octave, for inviting me into this program. And uh, I'm so very happy to join Maybao in this we too are biologists and uh, in the university uh, I used to lecture and teach the topic called developmental biology and I've taught that course for 20 years. So thank you TM and Mei for taking time out of your busy schedule to attend our broadcast. So um, we have one question for both of you first. So what is life? Mei Pao, maybe you want to try to answer that? Okay, so talking about life, right, means that all of us on this earth, living things. So all the plants and animals and your bacteria and your fungi that you see on this earth. So life, living things, we are made up of something that's very, very small. Octave, if you want to guess, what is it? Uh, I, my, bio, my bio knowledge only ends in sex. So it's okay, it's okay. This is something cells? that you learn. Yeah, yes, that's right. Okay, so our, our bodies are all living things are made up of cells. Some living things are made up of one cell. So we call them unicellular organisms. So like your bacteria. And there are also some living things like us, which are made up of many cells. So we are called multicellular organisms. And in case you are wondering, what are these things called cells, right? So they are very, very small, basic unit of life. And uh, you can only see them under the microscope. So when we look at cells, there are certain parts of these cells that are uh, uh, what we usually learn in school. So you have things like the uh, cytoplasm, you have the cell membrane, you also have this very important thing called the nucleus in the cell, which contains DNA. And it's kind of like the brain of the cell, so it controls all the functions. And I've got a picture to show you about these cells. So I took this in the lab back when we were still working in the science center. Now everybody's work from home. So this picture that you see over here, um, you will see it looks kind of like a face, right? With the two big eye, eye looking things and this yeah. inverted V. So the inverted V is a kind of a cell uh, from this organism called the amoeba. And if you look carefully, there's this darker dot right in the middle portion. So that's what we call the nucleus and that controls all the functions of a regular cells. Uh, so most cells have a nucleus. Uh, then you see those two pink round things beside it. Those are called volvox. So those are a type of algae, which is also a kind of living thing. So it's made out of cells as well. So that's the basic definition of a living thing, cells. But I'll leave TM to talk more about what is life. Yes, yes uh, Maypal, you have given uh, an explanation of the basic unit of life. The basic unit of life is known as cells, as what you just described. Uh, but if you want to define something that's living, there are certain characteristics that we talk about, and it's a typical uh, biology exam question. So uh, if we define life, the living form must be able to multiply. So cells must be able to divide. And not only to multiply, uh, the living organism must be able to reproduce. And this reproduction is to make more of themselves, uh, either through sexual reproduction or asexual reproduction. Other than uh, growth and, and multiplying and reproducing, another characteristic of uh, life form is uh, a living organism needs to take in nutrients from outside and then to bodily functions to metabolize and convert the nutrients into building blocks, as well as energy to sustain life. In the process, uh, waste is generated, so the organism must also get rid, get rid of the waste or store the waste. And in the process of uh, life uh, progression, the living organism will also undergo what we call morphological change. Uh, you will change from a certain form to another form, 
uh, from a juvenile form to an adult form, and in some organisms, they even undergo metamorphosis, uh, like caterpillar becoming a butterfly. And life also characterized by what we call aging and dying. So at the end of the life, there is end of life, and that is death. So these are characteristic of what we call life. I see. So, okay, my bio knowledge isn't really there. It's stopped at set two, right? So back in school, my teacher used to tell me that life requires um, oxygen, food, and water to survive. But recently, I read this article about organisms that don't require oxygen. TM, do you have a, can you enlighten me on this? Whether is this true? Yes, uh, in, indeed. I mean, the, if you can see the screen now, it is a uh, newly discovered organism. There are some form of parasites that live in salmon. And uh, these organisms, they don't need oxygen to, to, to live. Uh, and, and that is a proof that life form not necessarily depend on oxygen. And there are certain organisms that can also adapt to uh, conditions where oxygen is not freely available and they use alternate means, alternate chemicals to, to go through their life processes and to sustain life. And I think, Maypa, uh, you, you learn all this thing when you're a biology student. You're probably going to share a little bit more about organisms living uh, without yes. oxygen, right? Yes. Yeah, yes. Okay, so there are some other organisms uh, that can actually uh, get energy without using oxygen as a source. So uh, when I was in school, I learned about these uh, special kinds of fish. So usually fish, they get oxygen from the water that's dissolved inside using the gills that they have, right? But um, there are some kinds of fish that they come up onto land. So they do store some water to keep their gills moist to absorb oxygen, but their bodies are also made to um, use other ways of getting energy. So we call this anaerobic respiration. So they are able to get energy without using oxygen. So there are a lot of very interesting creatures out there in this earth. Yes, and, and maybe you described that fish, uh, I think that is the muskipper. The muskipper mm. has got this ability, right? Yes, when they come yes. on land. Yes. Yeah, so we can see these muskippers at uh, the mangrove areas in Singapore, so like Sungai Bulo, Chek Jawa, yes. and all that. Mm. Yes. Yep. See, I have another question for both of you. Um, it's very relevant to what we are going through now with all the situation, right? So bacteria is considered life, but virus yes. is not. Why is that so? Ah, that is a, a, a typical uh, study that we, we learned when we were in school. When I, when I started biology, uh, we learned about classification of living forms, living things. And when, when we talk about virus, it's classified as neither living or non-living. Uh, because it, it depends on where you find a virus. So virus, when it's outside of the host, they are, they are dormant, they are just there as particles. They, they don't replicate, they don't reproduce, and therefore they're considered non-living. Uh, but when virus jumps into uh, living cells or in the host, they will make use of the nutrients and the uh, components inside the cells of the host, and they'll start to replicate themselves. And after they've replicated enough, they will just get out of the cells and they will be spread outside the organism and they will try to jump into another host. And that's why uh, in this COVID-19 situation, we want to really contain the spread of virus and we do not want this virus to jump into another living organism so if they are outside of our body and they don't get into another living one, they are as good as dead. So they are considered sometimes not living. I see. Maypal, do you have anything to add? Yeah, and actually this debate that uh, people have, so some people actually believe that viruses are living things, where there are some who, who think that they are not categorized as living things, right? Um, I think it stems from some of the other animals that we have on this earth that... Um, they cannot live independently by themselves also. We call them the parasites. So parasites, you know, they need to live on some kind of host. So just now you, you asked TM about the little parasite that lives in the salmon, right? If you take it out of the salmon, it's it's not going to survive. So if in that along that same line, right, you take the virus out of its host, it will not survive as well. So, you know, do you consider it a living thing? But we consider parasites as living things, right? Yeah, so, regardless of whether you yeah. consider the virus living or non-living, I think it's creating a great disaster. So we better treat this virus <laughs> with respect. Yes. yes. With fear. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I see. Okay, uh, one more question before we go into our main topic today, right? Earth itself contains a lot of life. I mean, 
we are life itself, right? But how did life begin on Earth? Ah, this is a, a, a big topic, and uh, if you look into literature and look to history and, and look into uh, culture, uh, we can broadly look at the origin of life in two perspective. One is that uh, uh, there's a creator that created all life forms, big and small. So it's a creationist view of life they are created on planet Earth. On the other hand, you can also look at it from what we call a natural science uh, perspective. Uh, that is, if uh, after the Big Bang, uh, molecules and elements come together and uh, by chance they form something that is able to replicate themselves. And from simple molecules, they become more complex, from complex to, to even things like a DNA kind of structure. And later, they became cellular. And from single cellular form of life, multicellular form evolved. And the multicellular form evolved into different kinds with different morphology, organs, and structures, and functions to adapt to different parts on planet Earth. And that gives us the rich biodiversity. So the second explanation, which is widely uh, uh, taught in textbook, is through the process of evolution. I see. Okay, so a uh, message for all our audience, right? If you have any questions related to this topic, life in space, and you, you want them to be answered by our two experts here, I believe there is a link that is pinned in our comment box. Okay, click on that, send us your question, and then we'll try our best to answer as many questions as you can on the strip, right? So now, now that we learned about life, on Earth, right? So let's proceed into the main topic. And if you remember from the, our previous podcast, we tend to like to use movies a lot. So one movie we'll be discussing today is actually titled Life. Okay, watch the movie first before you proceed with the podcast because we will be discussing about the alien life form in the movie. Okay, so from the trailer, what we know is that this is a life form from Mars and not much else after that. So TM, I believe you have watched this movie as well. Can you summarize this alien life form for our audience? Oh yes, uh, Octave. Uh, well, this life form uh, was actually so-called revived from a piece of rock that uh, the astronaut collected from Mars. And under the tissue culture laboratory condition, uh, the revived single cell, as we see on screen, has got this uh, shape, like a, what we call a fusy form shape, like a little rice grain. And you can see a hair-like structure, the cilia, and surrounding it. And uh, this is a single, single cellular life form. And uh, May Pao, when you look at this, uh, does it remind you of something that you learned in biology class? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, lots yes. of things that we learn in bio class, actually. So yeah. firstly, the cilia that you mentioned, right, on the yes. outside. So this cilia usually helps the whatever organism that has it to move around in its environment. And yeah. it's usually found on organisms that are in uh, aquatic environments, so a liquid yeah. environment. So yeah. that means that this organism has to survive in some sort of liquid because if it's on dry land or, or air, it won't be able to use those cilia. And yeah. it actually reminded me of uh, uh, an organism that we have in our environment and also in our labs. So I've got uh, some videos over here to show you. So it looks kind of like this creatures over here. So this is a type of uh, organism we call protist. So protist is uh, the fifth kingdom of living things. So usually for living things, we have your plant kingdom, we have your animal kingdom, your bacteria, your fungi kingdom. And then you have this last one called the protist. So anything that doesn't fit in the previous four kingdoms, we'll list them into this protist uh, category. So on the screen here, you see all these little slipper looking things moving, right? These are kind of protists that are usually found in fresh water, in pond water. Yeah. yeah. And if you look carefully, you can see the cilia sticking out. Yes. Mm. And they are microscopic in size, right? Yes, correct. Yeah. So this um, video was taken using our microscopes in the lab that we are still in the science center. And I think I have a second video as well. Over here. So the big one is a kind of protist called a paramecium. The smaller ones are other types of protists, different different type, not paramecium, but still kind of protist. Yeah, the it, small one could be the food. Yeah, so so yes. Kelvin reminded me of this. Yes. Yes. Right. So in, in, in the movie, the, the single cell that was isolated and grown in a petri dish continued to divide and divide 
and they form a layer of cells. So this looks like a typical uh, tissue culture petri dish uh, that you see in modern lab. So from one cell become multicellular and it's one layer of cells. And this group of cells continue to change in form and uh, in the next stage of this development, uh, you can see in the next uh, screen that it becomes a three-dimensional structure and almost like a, 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 a tentacle coming out. And it has got cells that are specialized already. By then, it has got some kind of sensors, almost like neurons are in this group of cells. And it has got muscle function also because it can extend and contract. So from a group of cells, these cells differentiate to become a three-dimensional structure. And this organism continue to change its shapes. And uh, this colony of cells actually uh, coming together to form a living form can also be found in modern day organisms. And uh, maybe you want to uh, show us some example of such? Yeah, so when I saw this part about uh, it forming all these different structures, right? So actually we do have some organisms on Earth that they start off as individual bits, but then they come together to form one entire life form. So I've got uh, my first example over here. So maybe I'll play if you want to try and guess what is this? It looks like an alien to me. <laughs> yeah, well, anything that you haven't seen before, probably you want to call it an alien. Yes, but try to guess just by you know, how it looks like. It, looks it lives like a in the water. Uh, close, but no. Octopus? Close, but not yet. Usually it just kind of like floats in the ocean. Um, jellyfish? Yes, correct. It looks like a jellyfish, right? But no, it looks more, more like a squid to me. It looks like a squid to you. <laughs> okay, but this is actually not um, a jellyfish, although it is in the same group as a jellyfish. It's in the Nidarian category. So uh, this creature that you see over here is made up of many, many individual uh, bits to it that they come together to form this entire thing that you see on the screen. And uh, each individual actually assumes a different function. So some of these individuals, they take up the role of the digestive system. Some of these individuals, they take up the role of the reproductive system. And then some of them uh, take up the role of the stinging cells uh, at the tentacles area that you see over there. So and then they work together as a colony to survive. So that's that's one of the examples. OK, since yeah. you're not so sure about this one, right? I'll show you the next example. I think you will know what is this. Yes, okay. Corals. Yes, very good. So these little corals, right? They're not plants, huh, by the way. They are actually animals. So uh, they are also made up of individual bits of coral and they come together as a colony to form one entire big one. So in fact, um, scientists can actually use this to grow more corals. Am I right, Tian? Yes, yes. Uh, they're actually polyps. So the polyps are a group of cells and they come together, they form colonies and the colony, they form these branching structures. And if you break the corals into bits, the different colonies can also start to multiply and grow and reproduce themselves into uh, more colonies of uh, corals. So you can imagine the colony of cells is like little uh, Lego bricks putting them together and form a structure. And you break them into pieces, the Lego bits, they also are individual living entities, so to speak. Of course, we're not saying that Legos are, are living entities. Uh, but because of this, uh, people are using this to, to re rebuild uh, lost and corroded coral reefs because we can multiply by this cloning methods of the mm. polyps. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. So back to back to the movie, uh, uh, the, 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 the group of cells, the tissues start to transform, they start to branch out. And the next phase of the transformation is uh, the cells form almost like a starfish structure. So in the petri dish, you can see in this case, uh, shown on the uh, screen, uh, they have got some almost like blood systems or vascular system and nervous system inside this starfish looking uh, creature. And uh, this starfish looking creature later got out of the, the petri dish. And that's when the movie turned to be quite uh, scary uh, because it is now like a starfish almost with octopus kind of uh, feature, very strong, it can grip, uh, and it started to uh, uh, crawl and attack the astronauts. In fact, the astronauts became their food, uh, uh, not, not their food, it's food. And, and this uh, creature uh, continued to uh, terrorize, and quite a few astronauts were killed because of it. 
and it continued to transform and transform to uh, and grow to become almost like an octopus. Uh, so there is this scene of uh, this creature uh, is no more like a starfish. It has become more complex in in morphology uh, with octopus-like tentacles, and it float around in the uh, International Space Station. So imagine if this creature were to be living on Mars or even in any uh, planet, it must be in some kind of aquatic environment. Otherwise, on dry land, it will just collapse by itself. And it continues to, uh, uh, in a way, consume the, the astronauts. And it's probably because of uh, how it took in the, the humans, so-called, as, as food source. Uh, at one point, this creature continued to change into something quite scary, even like, like a face with jaw structure in there. Uh, so this whole sequence of from single cell to multicellular, from two-dimensional to three-dimensional, to really a very complex organism, almost like a monster with brains and, and all the bodily function that terrorize the International Space Station, is a very fast-paced movement and showing how this life came about. So you can imagine like this evolutionary pro, uh, uh, like an evolution compressed in short time, and outcome is a monster like this. I see. Okay, this whole monster, right? Our, our, our whole, whole alien, yes. started off from a single cell, and in the single cell grew, multiplied, and yes. then took on various functions. It kind yes. of remind me of what we call stem cells. So can you explain more on how what stem cells are? Yes, yes, uh, Octave, uh, although you say that you don't have much uh, biology, I think you're just hiding your deep knowledge of biology. In fact, stem cells. Stem cells is true. And all of us as multicellular organisms like you and I, right, we all start off with one single stem cell, uh, and that is the fertilized egg. So we all start our life with the mother's egg fertilized by the father's sperm, and one single cell starts to divide, and this group of cells will then start to transform and uh, many of these cells will become uh, the stem cells of nerve cells, stem cells of blood cells, stem cells of liver cells, intestinal cells and the muscle cells and so on. And all these cells uh, will then help to create different specialized tissue and cell type uh, which will then organize into our bodily organs and system to make us as an individual that integrates all the different uh, structure and functions to make us who we are. So you're right, that single cell that was isolated in that movie and started to grow, it acted like that stem cell. In fact, it would qualify as a stem cell. And uh, Mayfa, I think you learned about stem cell biology as well as the application, uh, right? You probably want to share a little bit more of what you know of uh, biomedical application of stem cells. Mm, yes, okay, so stem cells, um, it's, um, I think it's that kind of, you can call it technology in progress because they are looking at how to use these stem cells to do what we call uh, therapy for yes. people who have things like cancer or maybe... Uh, uh, like, like brain degeneration mm, yes. or your, your, your cartilage in your correct. knee joints. Get, yeah, uh, regeneration. Of like you get regeneration, parts. yes, yes. Mm, and, and, and in fact, in fact uh, uh, there's this interesting uh, study and discovery that even in our fat tissue, we have got fat stem cells. Mm, right? That's so right. uh, I, I used to teach this topic in the university and I also uh, share this possible scenario in the future that you can go for liposuction, right? And then when... <laughs> the fat tissue that is sucked out, you don't throw them away because you can harvest the liposuction left behind stem cells. And these stem cells can be cultured. And with stem cells technology, you can grow them and make them many numbers. And in time to come, you can transform them into useful cells, muscle mm. cells, cartilage cells, nerve cells, blood cells. And then you can transplant that into the damaged part of your body. And that's mm. called stem cell tissue therapy. And uh, that's the reason why many baby caught blood bank is uh, serving for this potential use. You know, when the umbilical cord uh, of a newborn, when it's cut it out, you, you, in there, there's a lot of uh, blood stem cells. And this embryonic cord stem cells can be used for this kind of stem, stem cell application mm. in the future. Yeah. yeah. Well, you say fat cells, right, TM? I think I don't qualify. I mean. <laughs> 
yeah, yeah, very yeah. little. I, you, you know, we are talking about who, right? I mean, our I, I do, I do. Interested <laughs> in that. <laughs> yes, yes. 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 Okay, moving on, right? So currently, we are trying to find life form. Not not really life form, but we are trying to find um evidence, right? Organic evidence on Mars, right? So. Recently, I read this article that salty water, really, really salty water, might actually exist on Mars. But given that Mars is cold and the water is salty, is it possible for life to actually um, develop there? May Pao, maybe you want to enlighten me on this? Well, when you say salty water, right, it just makes me think of our ocean, right? I mean, our ocean is very salty water, so I'm very sure... You all know we have a lot of um, things that live inside the ocean. So it's also very cold uh, and pretty dark also, which I think we'll talk more about later on. Very dark in those places where, like, it's, uh, for example, the deep oceans. So there are a lot of things that live over there. And uh, we'll talk more about them in a short while, I think. Okay. Yeah, we probably will, right? So, yes. Okay, one last question about the movie to TM, right? So... This monster or this alien was created on the International Space Station, which isn't really a natural condition, right, that life developed. Yes. Will that actually affect how, what it became in the end? If it developed somewhere else, will it be any different? Well, uh, uh, like all life forms, I mean, the, 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 the power of living thing is that uh, adaptation is, is the key thing. Uh, and uh, whether that original life form uh, as we see in the movie, is as it is, or as was existed existed in, in in Mars, it's hard to say because nobody has seen the prototype. Uh, but in in the in the movie, the conditions given to that single cells to grow and to transform was artificially created. Uh, even if it's close to the atmosphere of Mars, the nutrient given to that cells to develop and and, and grow. Uh, is unlikely to be the same as its original state. So whether the living form made use of whatever resources given to it, and then it start to reassemble itself according to whatever is available and adapted to the environment and enable it to so-called evolve into that creature, that alien that we saw in this movie. Um, so yes, uh, through adaptation, creatures can take on very different life form, different morphology, and perform very bizarre function even. Okay, I see. Now, uh, we have some questions coming in from our audience, so we'll answer a couple of these questions first. Okay, first question, I think TM might be more suitable to answer this, right? So, <laughs> one person, um, CY, okay, asked this question about whether do you believe, uh, what do you think about panspermia, and how plausible do you think it is. So for audience who don't understand what panspermia is, it's a theory that says that life on Earth actually originates from space. Organic materials from the space or microorganisms actually falls on Earth and then once it reaches a suitable condition, it starts to grow and it starts to um, form life as we know it. So TM, how, do you, how possible do you think this is? Well, uh, again, this is highly speculative uh, you, because we NASA has been sending out probes to look for organic life form in the in in, in outer space, extraterrestrial, and to today there isn't any conclusive uh, answer to that. And this whole hypothesis of uh, some organic life form actually started coming out on Earth from outer space uh, is just to push the question of actually where life came about to another location, right? Uh, but to to think that the environment beyond the atmosphere and out there with the cosmic ray and the kind of conditions out there, uh, they're actually not very suitable for life form to exist. Um, so if you ask me whether that is uh, likely possible to me, I would take it as extremely, extremely unlikely. Okay. Actually, that mechanism kind of reminds me of like some of the things that we have on Earth also. Because like you're saying that um, it's seeding, so-called like seeding, right, from other places onto a place that has conditions that's suitable. Um, yeah. Some of our uh, ferns, plants, that are reproduced by spores. So the spores, they're kind of like in an inactive state until they reach a place that is suitable for growth. 
So yeah. sounds similar to that. Yeah, I see. Okay, so um, I have another question. Um, probably maybe Pao can have an attempt at this. So recently there was this um video footage that was released by the Pentagon about UFOs, right? So what's your take on that video? Do you think it's true? Do you think it's false? Uh, well, um, it only showed the UFO. Okay, so at this part, I think we would, I would want to credit the team behind this because we actually have a team that's helping us to uh, answer some of these questions, right? So um, the footage of this UFO only shows something flying or floating over there, but there is no other uh, signs, so-called signs of life that were detected. So maybe, maybe not. No, well, nobody knows for now whether there is really other life or whether this is really a UFO. Maybe it's just a trick of the light or something like that. It's really very hard to say. <laughs> yeah, actually, the, this uh, reminds me of the Fermi paradox. I mean, uh, I think many of us may have uh, heard about this Fermi paradox. And Fermi in the 1950s, I mean, he was among the pioneer of the nuclear reactor. And apparently, it was a true, very casual discussion uh, at that time. They were talking about, oh, if, there, if, if planet Earth is relatively much younger in terms of the, the history of the whole universe, uh, then it's probably that it is probably that maybe some solar system or some galaxies far, far, far away, they existed much longer than planet Earth, and that may have given them enough time to evolve life form, so to speak, right? And, um, but then we on Earth, we couldn't find them. Uh, so that is a paradox. If they were there, how come we couldn't see them? And uh, lately, there are some discussions saying that uh, some people believe that aliens are with us. They're actually among us. Uh, so the, the studying of UFO and all that uh, actually is very hard to prove. Okay, it's very hard to prove. I know I saw the report and it's, it's, it's claimed to be a genuine report, genuine sighting. But just like many things in life, many things in nature, we can't explain them, right? Yeah. I see. Okay. So um, for our audience, right, if you have any questions that you want answered on the broadcast, okay, please click on the link in the comment box and send it to us and then we can get our two experts here to answer them for you. Okay, now to the next question, right? So are we alone in this world? Now, I've been asking the question so far, so let me add in a little bit on my end. So what I know is, um, currently we are looking at Mars for evidence of organic materials, right? In the future, NASA is actually planning to go even further. So the next, the, one of the destinations that NASA is going is actually Europa, a moon of Jupiter. So for those of you who don't know, Europa is a moon of ice. Instead of having rocky surfaces, it has a thick layer of ice surrounding it and underneath this ice there's supposed to be water and occasionally Europa actually the surface of Europa actually cracks and when it cracks it tends to throw out bits of ice and water into space so the plan was to actually send an orbiter to go around Europa and whenever these things get thrown into space the orbiter will pick up these samples and then test them for organic materials so all these organic materials organic evidence that NASA is looking at what is what are they actually looking for? Um, PM, can you tell me? Well, I mean, the, if if you are sending a probe to far, far away and you want to look for clues for life, uh, I think the natural starting point is using how we understand as the basic component of living structures. So certainly you're looking for carbon uh, kind of uh, complex carbon carbon based uh, organic compound and also water is important because uh, as we all know water is life uh, and i think probably people are looking at if there are evidence of molecules that can replicate like dna and so on uh, so this i would say that the clues uh, that we are hopefully could find okay uh, because uh, another assumption is that life form of something like us also existed using this kind of uh, uh, structure that we have here. Unless in the other side, uh, life is defined by components made of totally different kind of elements and uh, the structure and function is totally different from us, then we have no clue how to start from there. 
I see. Okay, so we have been trying to find life. Yes, I'm still quite skeptical about finding life in places as far as Europa, knowing that being a moon of Jupiter, Europa is a place that is really dark, it's really far away from the sun, and it is yeah. really, really cold as well. That's why ice exists, right? Hmm. Is there even yes. potential of finding life in this kind of places? Well, Octave, if you think about it, there are some places on Earth that have the same conditions as what you just mentioned, or Europa, right? Um, it's cold, it's dark, you can't really get any sunlight over there. So one of those places would be the deep oceans that I was talking about just now. So very deep into the sea, right? There's hardly any light because sunlight can't even get there. And it's also very cold under the ocean as well. So, but then scientists have found a lot of life forms over there. And these creatures, they are able to survive uh, the extreme conditions in that environment. So I'll show you an example of uh, one of these creatures. So we call them extremophiles because they are able to survive and thrive under such extreme conditions. So uh, the one of the ocean creatures I was talking about, I'll show you up on the screen here. So this picture that you see over here, okay, the, these are uh, snails that are found under water. Some of you will be saying, oh, underwater snail, nothing special. But this snail, these snails, right, they live near hydrothermal vents. So which means kind of like volcanoes that are found in uh, underwater. Okay, so the conditions there are quite uh, special because there's no light, right? So the organisms in that area, um, they survive, they get their energy using other methods. So uh, usually for life forms that are found on the surface that's all around us, um, animals-wise need to feed on something. You need to feed on maybe, say, another animal or you need to feed on plants, right? And these plants, they grow because of the sunlight that is uh, coming down to us. But what about all these organisms that live in the ocean? Where's this starting point from if there's no sunlight, right? So they're able to take up chemicals that are found in these uh, areas uh, in the deep ocean and they use that to generate energy. So we call them chemoautotrophs. So they use the chemicals around them to yep. generate uh, energy. And this snail, right, the special thing about it is called the scaly food snail. So you can see all the scales that are uh, found on this snail and it's able to take up the iron bits, the iron particles, iron compounds that are found in the hydrothermal vents and um, put it into parts of its shell and even those scales. So it makes the shell very hard. Yeah, and uh, they do that by using some bacteria that's found inside the snail itself. So this is uh, something quite recent okay, in the past uh, week or so that scientists have discovered. And not just these snails, there are a lot of other life forms uh, in the deep ocean, like different kinds of shrimp, different kinds of fishes, octopus, you mm. name it, whatever there is, they're all inside the deep ocean. So I think that's one of the places that um, pretty much mimics something like Europa's conditions. And if life can survive in that kind of condition, there's a good chance that, you know, life may be able to survive on Europa as well. Okay, now that you mentioned this, right, I think I'm reminded of a creature, something that was able to so-called survive even the vacuum of space. Um, mm. Do you know what that is? Yes, yes. I know what you're talking about. This one over here. So let me show you this picture. Okay, so this is our very cute little water bear. Okay, I, so... I, I wouldn't use cute to describe it. Why? Right. Right. Cute. It, it is cute, yes. Yeah, it's, it's not cute. something I want on me. Okay, yeah, let, we'll I, let I, the audience I think, I, think, I think it reminds him of ticks. Ticks. Fleas <laughs> and ticks. <laughs> kind yes. of. It, okay, so yes. this creature over here it has eight legs. Uh, I guess that's why Octave finds it a bit funny. Yeah. No, not, not cute at all. So um, this water bear or tardigrade, so what it can do is it can um, stay alive under extreme conditions for short periods of time. So we don't exactly uh, consider it an extremophile, but it is able to survive very hot or very cold conditions for a few minutes. Uh, optimal temperature for, for survival is still kind of like uh, you and I, around 20, 30 degrees. But it is also even able to survive dehydration. So you could dry this thing up. It won't die. It just goes into a dormant stage, so like an inactive stage. And then um, maybe say weeks later, months later, you sprinkle water on it, it'll come back to life again. And, and, and I think they have accidentally spilled a whole bunch of these water bears on the moon and they're still there. Just that they're in their dormant stage right now. Yeah. 
Yeah, and Octave, you also must remember that uh, although on screen this look big, like almost very scary monster, actually they are all uh, microscopic in size. Uh. Mm, so yes. they are actually very, very tiny. And that's why they can become dehydrated and yet stay dormant, uh, almost like spores, like what uh, Maypal talked about earlier. Spores mm. can be very small and, and they stay dormant when they're in dry form. So this water bear, when there's no water, it will just go into that kind of dormant state. Yeah. Mm. Yes, so the scientists are studying how they are able to, to survive these uh, extreme conditions and then hopefully it will be useful for astronauts who are travelling to go and explore other uh, planets that may be able yeah. to house life. So yeah. who knows, maybe you can in future dry up the astronauts and then when you need them, you just <laughs> put some water and then they just like pop back to life. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I don't think dry up per se, la, but uh, there was uh, a state of hibernation. If you remember the first alien movie, uh, they, they were in a, in a capsule, they were hibernating for a long, long, long time. And then later the program of the, the capsule allowed them to revive back. Um, so yes, if, if we can go into that kind of uh, control of our bodily uh, metabolic rate and so on, uh, you can actually keep life in so-called a suspended dormant state. Yeah. I see. Well, knowing that that thing is really small until I can't see it doesn't really make it cute at all. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> now, I guess it is safe to say that at this moment, we still haven't found any life in space beyond what we have on Earth. But yeah. there is definitely potential for it to occur, right? But looking at all the sci-fi movies, you see all the movies, or rather most of the movies, the aliens tend to be really hostile to humans or to life forms that is less superior than it. Do we really want to find aliens out there? Well, uh, I mean, the, if, if, if they're hostile, we don't want them to come to Earth, right? Uh, actually, whether you want to find aliens or not is, is a very fundamental question you ask human beings. We are asking the question, also, where, where do we come from? Are we alone on planet Earth? And then it's also linked to the question of origin of life, right? Um, so I think this, that quest, we want to find out if indeed there are other kind of life from elsewhere, uh, and another uh, purpose of finding life form in another uh, planet or, or habitat far, far away is, in a way, uh, some kind of uh, backup plan for the human race. Uh, in case we are so evil that we destroy this uh, planet Earth, that we destroy ourselves, so uh, this world cannot, this Earth cannot sustain us anymore. We go and colonize another Earth. So your, your part about an alien coming and invade us uh, and want to take over us, uh, would we be the alien going over to take over the others? I think this is a very interesting <laughs> question to talk about. Uh, but no, I do not want to go and find aliens that will come and destroy us. No. And, and actually, not all aliens in the movies are this, um, scary. We have, yes, we have yes. aliens that look like this over here. Yeah, yeah. And then my favorite one is E.T. E.T. is also very cute. Like, this one is also very cute. This. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes. And yeah. yeah, I mean, he's a little destructive, but then I think most people would find this sort of alien cute. Yes. So, yes. well, if we manage to find this type of alien, then... Hmm? I think I think the the alien that uh, warm our hearts like the, the the first ET ET go home the one that have the fingers at home uh, mm. that kind of alien show the value of love and I think that gives lives uh, the, the real rich meaning uh, whereas if in in other form of so called aliens between the alien movie and also this life movie uh, that life form is all out to destroy at the end what's the purpose purpose of that life so to speak right mm. uh, so. Uh, yeah, I think uh, life not just about physically, you are functional, that you can survive as a living organism, but the deeper meaning of uh, love, and also in this movie, the speech, uh, this, this is just talking about how he learned to love and adapt to so-called uh, harmonious living on planet Earth. I see. Okay. Now, some questions before we finish this broadcast. Okay, so the first question is from an audience called Hello. Um, Hello. <laughs> if, if, yeah. If love is basically chemicals combined together, then why can't we make life in the lab? Ah, uh, Anyone? That, oh, yeah. that, in fact, uh, when when this primordial soup and and uh, how all all life was supposed to come from uh, all these conditions and allowed molecules to come together, uh, this experiment has been done before. Uh, uh, but then it is. 
very artificial. You have to go and create a lot of uh, conditions uh, which which never existed in the early history of planet Earth. Uh, so to say that we can create out of simple molecules and elements to make life, uh, that is actually under very uh, artificial condition. Uh, so if I had an answer to the hello, the question is, uh, people are now looking to synthetic biology. So with synthetic biology, you start off with uh, DNA molecules uh, that can actually start the blueprint of making proteins and the protein come together, make structure, make cells. Uh, so yes, uh, to create artificial life form and artificial cells uh, is doable, uh, scientifically doable. Maybe Pao, do you have anything to add? What if I tell you to make life in the lab? Would you be willing to? Mm, there are some movies that they tried to do that. It didn't end well for them. So for now, I think let's leave it to the proper scientists if they want to try that out. Yeah, like this movie, The Life, right? At the end, uh, it was beyond our yeah. control. Because there's so many unknown uh, that even you think you can create a life at the end. It's just like the, the good old story of Frankenstein, right? Mm -hmm. Dr. Frankenstein. Yeah. Yeah. So all these are telling us that uh, Paul, you try to so-called, if I put in a, in a layman term, to play God, uh, we are mm -hmm. not God, right? So Yeah, yeah so right. I think there are a lot of ethical issues <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes. to go with this as well. Yes. So, yes. nah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that's, why bioethics, that's why bioethics is, is, is really regulating what we can or cannot do. Uh, after we know how to clone, we also need to use ethics to control. Do we really clone or not, right? Okay, another question for you. This is getting a little philosophical, right? So currently we are always involved with AI, artificial intelligence. So if one yes. day AI actually progress to a stage where they adapt to our lifestyle, you know, they are able to think and things like that. Do we consider them life forms? Uh, this, 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 this is an interesting uh, angle to look at life. Uh, in fact, uh, earlier on I talked about the Fermi uh, paradox. So uh, some people uh, say that uh, the firm, firm, firm paradox is such that even if there's intelligence life form very, very far away, the whole cosmic travel itself is very prohibitive or they cannot survive because you cannot travel so far away and uh, the radiation out there will kill all life form. Uh, but then somebody postulated that if that intelligence in that far, far, far away uh, place have such high intelligence that it can actually create artificial intelligence that uh, almost put in a simple way, robots assembling robots and robot assembling parts. So they keep assembling themselves all the way to these millions of years of journey and then come to, to Earth. So that is part of the Fermi paradox to explain certain yes or no possibilities. Uh, but is that life? Again, what is life? If life is about reproduction and, and, and transforming, yes, AI with machines and assembly thing can fit that kind of definition. Uh, that's why uh, if you say life beyond just structure and function, I would say yes, AI itself is life. But then we all know that life is more than that. Okay, uh, the whole idea of love, the whole idea of ethics, the whole idea of really wanting to to, to, in a way, embrace certain values. So our values, one plus one equals two, come from molecules, molecules coming together. Uh, so the whole idea of what is love, what is ethic, what is moral thinking is something that is beyond science. I see. Okay. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left. Actually, we have already overran, but there is quite a few questions coming in, right? So we are just going to answer one last question. Right, something light-hearted. So, what is your favorite alien movie and why? Maybe Paul, you to start first? <laughs> <laughs> okay, my favorite alien movie is the movie called Alien. <laughs> okay, so Alien, you know, with the big long head with his armor. So, why I like this movie is because, I mean, it's one of the first scary alien movies that I watched. I watched it when I was, like, in primary school. school? Yeah, but so, certainly from school. Well, I, I watch it. I watch it when I was in secondary school. And, yeah. And, uh, yes. I was having you nightmares. Were, you, you you may be in kindergarten at that time too. Yeah, I was having nightmares yeah. after watching it, but it was really nice because like yeah. you can see how these uh uh aliens are like. It's like one of the first time that you see aliens, right? So called aliens. Yeah, and they they have a lot of like adaptations. Thinking back on it, they they have their armor, which is able to withstand uh. 
all kinds of weapons, uh, even the acid that they produce on their own. And then later on in the movies, you can see the aliens evolving, even, right? They, they mate with even humans, and then they form this hybrid baby. So I think that movie is really, really good. Uh, that, is, that, is, that is more than one movie, one whole series of movies. Yeah, yeah, so it's like, it's one the movie, The original then, you know, movie, there was on. no mating and no reproduction of itself, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, it's except a franchise the, now. Yeah, yep, it's a franchise. Yeah. Yeah, and then I, you link I, on I, to the Predator movies as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I also like uh, Alien the uh, movie because as a biologist, uh, we know that it is actually exaggerating what parasites do in real life. And certain parasites actually get into uh, the first host and then they stay in the host and they will literally burst out of the body and transform to another form and they will go into their own new mode of life cycle and then they will lay eggs and eggs go back to the, another host and go and destroy the host and so on. Uh, but I also like another movie which is called E.T. Uh, I, I like E.T. more than the other alien movies because at least in E.T. it, it brings out the meaning of life, the purpose of life. And, and in this case, uh, the family loved this E.T. so much that they actually came back to look for, look for it. And this, this little E.T. Uh, teacher, uh, the alien that lived with the family boy, he also learned. And, and you can see the love coming out from this movie, so much so that when finally the close encounter of the family with us, uh, there's no hostility because we all are bonded together with this universal principle of universal of love and family. So I think that ET itself brings out a lot of very interesting perspective for about what life is versus all the other alien movie tends to just frighten you and scare you. <laughs> And, and make sequel one after another because there's no <laughs> end to gauze and <laughs> I, I mean for me watching movies yeah. i like action movies so you know plenty of action in there yeah, yeah. how about you that Octave? Is true. that is true Perfect i movie. like lilo and stitch <laughs> why because he's cute <laughs> who doesn't yes. like a cute alien yes that's right, right. Yeah. yeah okay yeah. all right so unfortunately we are out of time so we, are, we will have to conclude this podcast here. So thank you everyone for having you here today. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Thank you TM and Nepal for attending our podcast today and sharing with us the biological side of what is life and life in space. Okay, other than the two of them, there's actually quite a few people working behind the background. So we have Perry as the tech guy and we have our whole team actually answering all your questions okay, on Facebook and behind the scenes, right? So a big shout out to all of them. Now. Before we end this off, okay, PM, I believe you have a message for all our audience. Well, uh, I think I think uh, this movie life also brings about uh, what's the purpose of life, and and uh, I think we also need to reflect upon ourselves, right? Uh, the you saw in the movie uh, the astronauts they try to prevent that uh, alien monster coming onto planet Earth because they know that if this creature landed on planet Earth, it's going to cause destruction. And we have to reflect on ourselves. I mean, are we also, as a human being, uh, very intelligent? Are we, in a way, also destroying our planet Earth habitat, especially for many, many other life forms? Um, so uh, it's 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 worth thinking about it and how we should come together to protect and make our world uh, more sustainable and also keep the bio biodiversity going. Um, so I think, uh, being science fiction, uh, there's always certain underlying message that we should take heat off. And I thought uh, the discussion today, uh, although it's, it's a very short time, uh, is, is more than what we can continue to discuss about that is life, whether it's planet Earth or indeed there's an extraterrestrial uh, life form out there. Yeah, and also looking about invasion and all that, we also must be very mindful about the COVID-19, the, the virus in a way is like that invasive uh, creature destroying our life form. So we must also do our bits to prevent and break the COVID virus uh, spread, uh, break the circuit, and then we can live back to normal. Right? Okay. So I think uh, that leaves us to uh, my final message, that is to uh, stay home, to stay safe, and also keep looking up. Keep looking up because up there, there are many, many fascinations. Keep looking up also. Be positive about whatever challenges may come our way. So stay home, stay safe, and keep looking up. Okay, All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.